when I came to Australia as an international student, I would never dream that one day I had the opportunity to lead a project by the Australian government to enhance the engagement of international students. Personally and professionally meaningful to me and especially in that project, we had the opportunity to look at student engagement, not just in a traditional way that we often think about engagement, like the engagement between human to human or engagement between international student and domestic students or international student and the local communities, but we extend it to the engagement in accommodation, engagement in mental health and well-being, engagement in teaching and learning, in their navigation through crisis and critical incidents and engagement in the workplace, in work integrated learning and employability. G'day and welcome to Global Horizons. I'm your host, Rob Malicki, coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. Thank you for your company. And I'm thrilled today with our guest, Lee Tran, who is a professor in the School of Education at Deakin University, and quite honestly, is one of Australia, in my view, most prolific international education researchers. And she's got a heck of a bio. Starting with, and Lee, I hope we get around to talking about this, you were named one of Vietnam's 50 most influential women. And in terms of your research, you've been working as an ARC Future Fellow, which is a big deal, studying the impacts of the new Colombo plan around learning and engagement. You've got a PhD from the University of Melbourne, and I feel very lucky to have you here on Global Horizons. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for having me. And Liz, as, as part of my preparation for this interview, I read, and, and this I find incredibly hard to believe, but you know, you never know what you're reading on the internet. You had your first child whilst in the first year of your PhD program. Is that true? Yes. So thank you for uh, bringing up that memory of having my first child in, in the middle of my um, PhD. So I was an international student by then. Um, I came from Vietnam and I was offered a scholarship to do a PhD at the University of Melbourne. And I was quite naive by that time. You know, I, I love having children and I thought that it is the right time. You know, you, you, you don't have to work, but you get paid by your scholarship. You have a lot of time, you have the freedom, you have the flexibility. So why not having a baby? And I remember I was three months into my PhD and I ran into my supervisor office at the University of Melbourne and announced with her that, you know, you know, guess what I'm having? I'm going to have a baby and yet only three months into your PhD. And uh, of course, my supervisor said congratulations by that time. But upon my graduation, um, three and a half years later, she admitted that at that moment when she saw me being so happy announcing the pregnancy news, um, she thought that I would never do with my PhD. I would never complete my PhD. But um, she couldn't say that because I was so happy then. So she <laughs> held on into that. Yeah, so basically that the whole journey of undertaking a PhD and um, having a baby and clearly the baby is my more focus, um, but it gave me the opportunity to have a very meaningful study journey at an international student in Australia because um, I learned to work more efficiently because I know that I didn't have a lot of time if I didn't focus on my study with in a certain time that I have when the baby is at sleep or someone had to look after the baby for me or baby is at childcare, I wouldn't complete my, my work efficiently. So I learned to use my, my time more effectively. But most important thing, I learned to see the meaning of my study and see how rewarding it is because I have someone who is the most precious person in my life to travel with me along that study journey. So I have to do something to deserve him. So that really, really a source of intrinsic motivation for me. And yes, luckily I 
I completed my PhD and got a couple of awards out of the PhD, maybe because of the inspiration from the baby. Yes. I love this story, Lee, because we've known each other for, for a little while, but I'm always amazed by just how much you manage to get done. You seem to be involved in numerous research projects at any one time. You're prolific in terms of writing articles, you're in the news, you're on Twitter. And I've always asked myself, where does she find the time to do this? So I imagine that juggling of two very major commitments, yeah, really honed your time management skills. Indeed, it is, it is. When I was single, you know, and, and without any child during my master. I had the luxury of time, but I wasn't fully aware of that. You know, I, I still study, but not that concentrating. But the baby really gave me the motivation to concentrate because I'm aware that I don't have a lot of time and, and someone is helping me right now so that I can focus on my study. And that certainly the skill that you mentioned, you know, to juggle multiple things at the same time. And I think the instinctive motivation is really the thing that shape our capacity to manage time effectively and to prioritize things and to juggle multiple tasks. Sorry, where, where does that in, intrinsic motivation come from for you? Yeah, so I think the intrinsic motivation come from the double jobs of being a mother and being a student. Um, for me, being a mature um, female student, you know, coming back to study after a couple of years in, in, in the workforce. And now I, I have um, the beautiful baby. So it's sort of a life gift for me that I try to make the best of the time to make it as meaningful as possible, not just for myself and my family, but for the new human being that I'm gifted with. And interestingly, a lot of my colleagues later on keep asking, you know, you must drink a lot of coffee to keep you awake to, to complete your PhD. But I never drink coffee in my life. And I do think that the baby keep me awake and keep me concentrating. Interestingly, I'm coffee free and I haven't learned to drink coffee yet as well as tea. <laughs> so in terms of because as a researcher, you have many responsibilities and, and being being inside a university as well. I mean, there's the research work itself. I presume you're teaching as well. Are you teaching? I used to teach a lot, but with the future fellowship, I mainly focus on research and doing guest lectures and invited presentations. Incredible. Then there's the teaching side, the research, and then the communicating side, the time to write the articles and then um, distributing those articles. How have you learned to balance those elements of your work? Do you have one which has a clear priority over any other? Balancing those responsibilities is not easy at all. Um, I constantly struggle, even though on the surface it's, it looks fine and, you know, the same at a lot of other academics and, and researchers. I have a profile page where we are encouraged to list all our achievements and, and publications so that the audience may accept it if they are interested. In. So it all looked brilliant and, and beautiful, but be, behind that, there is a struggle. And I said, you know, no matter how much I learn how to use my time effectively and have a strategy to prioritize things, the, the boundary between work and personal life and social life is quite blurred especially when you are a researcher and an and academic, you, you have a lot of autonomy and control over your work. But there are so many interesting things that we want to do. And there are so many in interesting and important stakeholders that we liaise with. And so many projects that are so very meaningful. Um, and, and how to balance that is, you know, really a challenge. But as I mentioned, you know, to some extent, I, I learned to really focus on the thing that I prioritize at a time, for instance, you know, for the new Colombo plan at a collection, talking to NCP students and, and academics and practitioners who are working in the fields. And I see the meaning and the pleasure in doing it. So it, it helped a lot, but also another big commitment that I juggle a bit is communicating the research findings with, with the audience would take considerable amount of time. But I, I see 
that we, we need to move beyond the traditional responsibility of a researcher, just, you know, mainly published in traditional journal articles and really conceptual framework. I feel an ethical and um, professional responsibility to find the time and communicate the research findings to practitioners and lay audience and related stakeholders in the communities that are outside education institution. Learning curve or learning journey for me because um, I don't speak English as a native speaker, but I have to juggle between academic tone and also lay, you know, the media tone. But I, I was lucky that I have the support from the media team at Deakin, but also my college, you know, who taught me along the way about how to communicate things in a plain and simple language and how to slay conceptual and big data research findings into the language that practitioner can engage with. It's fascinating. I mean, you've opened up all of these uh, different channels that I'd love to explore. But the, the one that's really struck me, you seem like somebody who's naturally really curious. You know, you're talking about how you have all of these different paths that, you know, potential research paths in front of you. Where does your curiosity come from, do you think? Where was that born from? So curiosity is certainly ingrained in me, I guess. That is really related to my personal background. I was born in, in Vietnam at the end of the Vietnam War. I was born by the end of December 1975. So the country enjoyed freedom and reunification after the Vietnam War, but also we experienced isolation as a consequence of the embargoes that the American imposed on Vietnam after the war. So we, we didn't have access to a, a lot of materials and resources that students at that time could have to. And a lot of information about the outside world didn't reach it by that time. So I was always curious, you know, growing up, in, in a small town in the 17 parallel, which divided the country into two parts during the Vietnam War about, you know, how the world outside would look like and whether we live in a bubble. And we study with u uniform textbooks and the curriculum was sort of one, one source and one stream of information flowing through it. So I was really curious to understand the world outside and when I had the opportunity to study in Australia, it's really eye-opening for me. And that's why, you know, that curiosity has led me to understand the experiences and the outlooks of other international students uh, from Vietnam, but also from other countries. And that has been a focus of, of much of your research uh, around the international student experience here in Australia. Um, you're the lead for the best practice project on international student engagement, which was funded by the Australian government's um, International Education Innovation Fund. Now, they didn't fund very many projects, so to pick up a project there is a, is a big feather in the cap. And then, of course, the International Student Graduate Employability Project too. So clearly this is an area that you're really engaged with. Yes, certainly. I'm the pro project lead for the best practice international student engagement project funded by the Australian government. And that project is particularly meaningful to me because, you know, when, when I came to Australia as an international student, I would never dream that one day I had the opportunity to lead a project by the Australian government to enhance the engagement of international students. Personally and professionally meaningful to me, and especially in that project, we had the opportunity to look at student engagement, not just in a traditional way that we often think about engagement, like the engagement between human to human, or engagement between international student and domestic students or international student and the local communities, but we extend it to the engagement in accommodation, engagement in mental health and well-being, engagement in teaching and learning, in their navigation through crisis and critical incidents, and engagement in the workplace, in work-integrated learning and employability, because we see that those 
dimension of an international student life are really interrelated. For instance, their engagement in accommodation may affect their engagement with domestic students and people who live in the shared accommodation, but also impact on their mental health and well-being and their engagement in teaching and learning. So we, we look at engagement within the curriculum and across the curriculum and extracurriculum activities. Yeah, I mean, I think you've probably seen more under the hood of the student experience than, than probably most people. If, if I could give you a magic wand, knowing what you know and knowing all the experiences from the people that you've spoken with, and you could solve one challenge that international students in Australia face, what would the challenge be? Does that make sense? <laughs> Certainly. Because there are many, right? There, there are so, there are so many. Where, you know, from from the disorientation that you know, and the culture shock when people first arrive, settling into communities, balancing study and work. I mean, there are so many challenges that our international students face. Which one would you fix if you could? Based on the data of our research across the past decade or so, the most challenging but desirable aspect of an international student life in Australia is a lack of connection with domestic students and the local communities. So if I have a magic wand, I certainly want to look into that area because it's so desirable, but it's so difficult to, to achieve. Have you seen anyone doing it well? Any examples of where it's been done really well? Yes. So in our good practice guide, we gather a range of examples about education providers across different sectors from the school, Elikosh, vet and higher education are doing well. But I guess one of the key areas that institution could do well in that space is where they can foster or tap on the partnership between international student support services and the learning abroad office. Because we can see the paradox here with the new global plan and other learning abroad scheme. The Australian government is committed to sending thousands and thousands of Australian students uh, overseas, especially to the Indo-Pacific, to enhance their Indo-Pacific knowledge and to nurture their connection with the Indo-Pacific community. But how about the Indo-Pacific communities or international student community onshore? Have we, yes, effectively tap on that resources in order to enhance intercultural competence and Indo-Pacific knowledge for both domestic students and international students? It is a wonderful initiative to send our students, or our local students overseas for them to develop intercultural competence and, and Indo-Pacific capability and lift up their knowledge and understanding of the Indo-Pacific. But what is really important is that we shouldn't forget the resources onshore, you know, the including Asian literacy, Asian resources, transnational knowledge, transnational experiences that international students bring into the classrooms, we can see that there is a common desire here, you know, from international students to have more connection with domestic students and for the Australian government to have domestic students to understand more about um, other countries and enhance their global outlook. Um, but what is is often forgotten or ignored is the closer partnership between international student office and learning abroad office so that we can together do it better. For instance, we have, can have international students to buddy or to mentor Australian students who are heading abroad at pre-departure and also re-entry programs. But more than that, we can have the mechanism to um, develop long-lasting or more sustainable friendship and connection for both groups, even after their periods of learning abroad in Indo-Pacific or after the student, international students have graduated and returned to their home country. And I think um, some university have program to connect international student alumni or graduates in particular countries like in Japan and Vietnam with NCP students who are heading to those countries and um, who have arrived in those countries. But we can do that 
before it at the pre departure state because we have, you know, around 500,000 international students onshore and around 80% of them are from the Indo-Pacific. So I think it would be wonderful if we can tap onto that. Who should be leading that? Because it's such a, it's a, it's a huge initiative, right? Like for learning abroad and outbound students, that's an incredible opportunity, both before they leave Australia and after they return. It's a fantastic opportunity for international students in Australia uh, to bring them closer to the community. It's, it's incredible in terms of internationalization of the curriculum and the classroom experience. So in, in your view, Lee, who, who inside institutions should be leading that sort of um, collaboration? I do think that there, there need to be a how up institution approach to internationalizing the student experience for both international and local students. And I feel that responsibility of leading the whole institution approach should be in the, the office of the pro vice chancellor or deputy vice chancellor international or global engagement um, because they, they are in charge of those portfolios, but also um, transnational education and transnational research collaboration and internationalizing the curriculum and teaching and learning. And, you know, as you sort of flag out, those dimensions are interrelated and complementary to each other. If you were to look across the, our entire industry and really thinking about universities here rather than other, other providers, obviously you're going to have some institutions that are doing that incredibly well, others that are, you know, not doing it very well at all. Where do you think as, as, a, as, as a whole sector, we, we fit on like on a, on a scale of 10, you know, are, are, we, are we a five, are we a seven? How, how are we doing, do you think, across the board? I do think we are still operating in silos. I mean, different portfolios of international engagement within education providers, both, you know, in the vet, in the school and in the higher education sector are still operating in silos. And there's a lot of potential for those portfolio to leverage on the strength of each other and benefit the student community and also the teaching and learning community. Clearly it needs strategic vision at the leadership level, but also the resources um, and, and the opportunity for different portfolios to do professional development together and, and planning together so that the as the institutional level, but at the government level, I think DFAT, um, the NCB can, can, can lead the initiative here to have strategic plan and, and work together with universities in order to more effectively enhance the engagement between NCB students and alumni and international students and international alumni, because, you know, clearly we have a significant international student onshore, but also a considerable proportion of international student graduates who are on temporary visas and who long for belonging and who long for the connection with the local community and domestic student and domestic, domestic graduates. So the latest data from Home Affairs show that more than 160,000 temporary graduates visa was granted between the beginning of 2022 and April 2023. So that is a really considerable number. And as I mentioned, you know, they no longer belong to their institution and they are in the workforce or they are in the community, but they have haven't got um, a point of contact or a point of connection so that they can develop a sense of belonging to Australia or at least, you know, make their temporary state after graduation in, in our country uh, more fulfilling. I think that's an area that certainly different stakeholders can work together better and there should be a more coordinated approach across different stakeholders to support international students, international graduates, onshore on temporary visa, local students and alumni, for instance, you know, learning across alumni who come back to, to Australia. Um, yes. Last question. If you could choose to do any research project, money was no, no impediment. Somebody just said, here's a million dollars, $5 million, $10 million, however much money you, you reasonably needed to, to research a particular topic. Um, what would you choose? 
Wow, Rob. And you you did it awesome. And you didn't have to go and pitch for it. Somebody was just coming to you with a bucket of all the money that you needed to do it to do a project. What would it be? I have two options here, if you don't mind. Of course. Some um, different research project that I had the opportunity to be involved all over the past um, 20 years or so. The happiest the happiest group of participants are NCP students and the more disappointing ones, international student graduates on temporary visas. I would love to continue um, a research project with NCP students, but ethically and, and personally, I am drawn to the struggling group, which is international student graduates on temporary credit visa who are for A5 visa because there's a lot of injustice and structural barriers that they are encountering at the moment and there is significant mismatch between policy intention and the reality of life in Australia after graduation and the reality of the labor market that inhibit their capacity to fulfill their dream in in terms of future life, migration life, employability aspiration, but also their aspiration to be and become a graduate, a human being and a worker the way that they want to do. So, you know, I feel inclined to, to do more research into that area, to look at the micro level of the structural condition that inhibit their capacity to com- contribute to the workplace, but also to fulfill their life dream. Um, but also, you know, hopefully with that line of research, we can make practical recommendation for different stakeholders to improve life of those international graduates on temporary graduate visa. I think it's very well earned and particularly with the relationship between Australia and Vietnam getting closer all the time. And we've had some some significant movement in that relationship, particularly this year. I'm, I'm sure that will continue to be even more important for the relationship between our two countries. Lee, it's been it's been wonderful having you here on Global Horizons. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. And I guess I'll see you in a couple of weeks. It's probably going to date when, when we're doing this recording, but I'll see you in a few weeks at AIEC. I yes, I will be there, but not for the full conference, but I will be there on Thursday and Friday. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to seeing you then. Likewise. Thank you, Rob, for the opportunity. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.